Well, good morning and welcome. I am Loretta Johnson, and in my day job, I serve as Secretary Treasurer for the American Federation of Teachers, AFL-CIO. I also have the pleasure of serving as the Chair of the Board of Directors of the Institute for Women Policy Research. And together, IWPR, the Women's Research and Resource Center at Spelman College, and the Wesley Center for Women and Wesley College, three of the leading gender-focused policy research centers in the United States, have convened leading researchers, advocates, practitioners, and policy makers for a meaningful fact-based discussion on complex issues underlying the current social and political climate. We are so pleased that you could join us today. There have never been a more critical time to ensure that policymakers, advocates, and practitioners rely on rigorous research and facts to drive social change. As our country continues to grapple with gender and racial inequalities in health care, the economy, the political system, we must also contend with a troubling amount of fake news, misleading information. This forum today strikes at the heart of the intersection between those two trends. We've had an incredible lineup of speakers to discuss a range of issues confronting the country and the opportunity to inspire change for women and their families. We hope you will leave today empowered with research resources to strengthen the fight for equality and influence. So let's get started. I'm introducing Senator Maggie Hansen. First, we are honored to welcome Senator Maggie Hansen with us of New Hampshire. Senator Hansen joined the Senate in January. Prior to that, she was the 81st governor of New Hampshire. She is the second woman in America in history to be elected on both governor and the United States Senate. Throughout her two terms as governor, she's responsibly balanced the bu state budget, worked to implement comprehensive approach to the OPOD crisis, and has froze in-state tuition at state universities, lower tuition at college, at community colleges. Meanwhile, New Hampshire's unemployment rate dropped to amount to the lowest in the nation. Great work, Senator. <laughs> As Senator, she has worked to call attention to the OPEC crisis, the impact of proposed changes to health care policy on women and children's access to education, and many other issues of importance to women. She has experienced working across the aisle to improve the lives of women in New Hampshire and beyond. With her unique insight as governor and now senator, Senator Hansen is a perfect person to start today's forum. Please join me in welcome Senator Hansen. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for that welcome. Thank you, Loretta, not only for the introduction, but for all your work. And I'd also like to recognize the Institute for Women's Policy Research, the Women's Research and Resource Center at Spelman College, and the Wellesley Centers for Women. And in particular, Heidi Hartman, Beverly Guy Scheftel, and Laylee Mapayan uh, for convening this symposium. And I am Sorry that I can't be here to hear the whole program. Uh, today is Wednesday in the United States Senate, and we start with committee hearings and just kind of the gauntlet begins. So I'll be leaving right after my remarks, but I will be eager to hear about your day. Because you've all gathered here to have a really important discussion about the state of women's rights and equality in every corner of our nation, uh, and as importantly, what research facts and data can tell us to help uh, move the agenda forward. From issues like child care and paid leave, income inequality and social justice, the priorities you're addressing today must be at the forefront of any discussion of building a stronger future for women and a stronger economic future for our country. 
The strength of that foundation will be determined in part on the by the debate happening now in Washington, uh, in particular on how we move our nation's health care system forward. To compete economically on a level playing field, women must be able to make their own decisions about if or when to start a family. They should not have to pay more than men for health care, and they should be able to visit providers of their own choice who understand their health care needs and to fully participate not only in the economy, but also in our democracy. Women must be recognized for their capacity to make their own health care decisions just as men are. Unfortunately, the Trump administration and Republicans in Congress are focused on an agenda that restricts women's access to critical health services and undermines women's constitutionally protected rights. Trump care would hurt hardworking people across New Hampshire and America, and in particular, women. What Trump care proposes in a truly dangerous bill would lead to higher costs for less care. If you have a pre existing condition, including cancer, asthma, or diabetes, you could once again be discriminated against with higher costs that make health care coverage unaffordable. If you buy your own health care, Trump care means you will face 20% higher premiums in 2018, with especially high premium hikes for older Americans. If you are a mother, giving birth could now be considered a pre existing condition. And it would undermine the requirement that insurance companies must cover essential health benefits, including maternity care. Trump care also ends Medicaid expansion, which would take care away from millions. And we know that when women are uninsured, they face avoidable adverse health care outcomes. If you are an uninsured woman, you are less likely to use prescription contraceptives and may face barriers to paying for contraceptives, increasing the chances of unintended pregnancy. If you are uninsured and pregnant, you are less likely to receive prenatal care services, which increases the risk of maternal health issues. And if you are uninsured and get breast cancer, you are more likely to die from cancer or complications from it than women who have insurance. Trump Care also changes Medicaid into per capita caps, which is really just code for massive cuts that would force our states to choose between slashing benefits, reducing the number of people who can get care, or both. Under this plan, states will be faced with cutting services that people who experience disabilities, people in nursing homes, and children depend on. These Medicaid cuts would have drastic impacts for families across our country. And according to the CBO, Medicaid pays for nearly half of all births in the United States, and it covers one in three children across our country. Additionally, Trump Care and the administration's budget proposal continue attacks on women's health care by defunding Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood provides critical primary and preventive health care services to thousands of women in New Hampshire, including preventive care, birth control, and cancer screenings, and defunding it is truly unacceptable. In just a few short months, the Trump administration has made clear that it is laser focused on rolling back women's rights and access to care, by the way, not just here in the United States, but across the globe. And it's up to all of us to make clear that we will not tolerate acts that undermine our progress. Women in particular are playing a vital role in standing up against this administration's efforts. I've been encouraged by the incredible outpouring of grassroots energy that we've seen in recent months from marches and rallies like the Women's March to the historic number of Americans picking up their phones, calling their representatives, fighting for their priorities. We have made clear that we will not be silent in the face of adversity. And this continued engagement is really critical to the future of all of our citizens. You all are going to spend a lot of time today really honing in on critical research and data that will help you stand up for the priorities that are important to women men and families across our country and around the globe. And I want to offer you my encouragement, um, not only as a senator and a former governor, but as the mother 
of a young man who happens to experience very severe disabilities. It became very clear to me when our son Ben started preschool at age three in a publicly funded preschool that he was able to go to school in his home community and learn and make friends because of the work that champions and advocates had done generations before us. Our founders started this country on the very basic principle that every single one of us matters and counts. And as this room knows better than many, they didn't exactly count everybody at first. They did have confidence, though, that every generation of Americans would work to include more and more people, bring people in from the margins, that when they did that, it would be good for the cause of human freedom and dignity, important in their own rights, but also it would have the effect of unleashing a kind of talent and energy the world had never known. Ultimately, that has what has been our great success as a country, as a people, as a democracy. And by gathering today, drilling down on facts and data and thinking about the arguments you need to help people come together and move forward. You are continuing that tradition of service in a democracy that makes us who we are. Now, I will also say as the mother of a young man with very severe physical disabilities that inclusion is difficult. This is hard work. And again, I'm looking at a group of people who I know understand that. So as we move forward in a difficult time, remember that the work is hard, but so incredibly worthwhile. And that as you learn and as you gather your facts and hone your arguments and reach out to your fellow citizens, even those who don't share your perspective or point of view or your background, and engage, that you, in fact, will be doing the critical work of this democracy, and you will be successful, and we will move forward. Keep at it, and thank you. Thank you, Senator Hassan. And thank you so much for sharing your insight and time with us today. We need people like you to fight for women, and I'm glad you're going back to fight. <laughs> now I have the chance of introducing our panel. Uh, now we'll hear from Dr. Beverly Guy Sheffall of Spelman College Women Research and Resource Center, Layla Mapaya of Wellesley Center for Women, and Heidi Hartman of IWPR to discuss how we got here. And then the panel, uh, panels will go out throughout the day. We'll explore where we go from here on the intersectional of race, religion, immigration, and civic engagement, paid leave policies, women's well-being and safety, and the status of the black women. It is now my pleasure to turn over to our distinguished panels and to Dr. Beverly Guy Sheffall to start us off. Each of us is going to speak for about five minutes and maybe we'll have a, a, a little bit of time because we're on a tight schedule for some response by the audience. It would be no exagger exaggeration to say uh, how difficult and complex it is going to be to think about how we got here. It is also very difficult to analyze with any degree of certainty, even though we are policymakers, how we got here. I want to start by acknowledging, and I think we don't do this enough, what it feels like for some of us who have tried to capture the impact of the November 2016 presidential election. I want to begin with a blog from Alice Walker and some reflections that she entitles, What to Do with the Mind That is Overwhelmed by Grief and Disbelief. So I'm quoting initially from Alice, our classmate from Spelman College. I have not been this depressed since President John Kennedy was assassinated. No, 
I have not been this depressed since Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. No, I haven't been this depressed since Malcolm X was assassinated. No, I have not been this depressed since Robert Kennedy was assassinated. There is also the journalist David Remnick, who's also editor-in-chief of The New Yorker, who wrote a piece entitled An American Tragedy on the day after the election in November. And I just pulled one sentence from that piece. It is impossible to react to this moment with anything less than revulsion and profound anxiety. So how did we get here? I want to foreground race as one of the variables. And I want to mention very briefly three things. First, there were important shifts in the racial groups which actually showed up in the polls. Black turnout declined dramatically, and white turnout increased noticeably. I'm quoting from port side. Number two, and this is, this is really amazing and is not totally uh, true just of this uh, presidential election. Low turnout, tens of millions of eligible voters in the U.S. simply did not come to the polls. And then finally, there was voter suppression which is a variable that we don't talk about very much. Our first election, many of us would argue, in 50 years without the full protection of the Federal Voting Rights Act. Millions of people, millions of people eligible, eligible to vote could not because of newly enacted barriers, particularly in states such as Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Florida. In other words, there were new voting restrictions. I want to end with Angela Davis, who spoke at the University of Chicago in November to a packed audience of 1,600, where she urged them not to mourn, but to engage in grassroots organizing. She also quoted from civil rights activist Anne Braden, quoted from her 1972 letter to Southern white women in order to make a, a, a comment about the differential voting among white and black women in the presidential election. And I want to quote from this letter very, very quickly. I believe that no white women reared in the South or perhaps anywhere in this racist country can find freedom as a woman with, until she deals in her own consciousness with the question of race. We grow up, little girls, absorbing the stereotypes of race. The picture of ourselves is somehow privileged because of the color of our skin. The two mythologies become intertwined, and there is no way to free ourselves from one without the other. The issue of race, then, in all of its complexity, continues and helps us to understand how we got here. Good morning. I'm Heidi Hartman, president and founder of IWPR. I am really delighted to see all of you here. I am going to discuss why the majority of white women voted for Donald Trump, since that's an obvious important reason why we are where we are. And I just want you to know that I got the short straw. Actually, I volunteered to do this topic. 53% <laughs> of white women voted for Donald Trump, but only 43% voted for Hillary Clinton. Why was there such a large difference in white women's vote share for Hillary, especially compared with black women's and Hispanic women's vote share? I've been trying to get to the bottom of this question since. Many people were surprised, myself included, that the gap was so, so large. And while Clinton did do better than Obama, with only 42% of white women voting for Obama versus 56% for Romney, that was pretty cold comfort. 
From reading the experts, I have five points, and I hope I can do them in five minutes. <laughs> the first point is that the majority of white women voters nearly always support the Republican Party candidate. In other words, Republicans vote Republican, and Democrats vote Democrat, Democratic. And the political scientists say, why should anybody expect any different? But obviously, we did expect something different, partly because, number one, Candidate Trump showed himself to be so hostile to women in so many ways during the campaign, attacking Megyn Kelly of Fox News during one debate, hulking over Hillary Clinton in another, not to mention bragging about his sexual assaults. And then, number two, the first woman on the ticket as a candidate for president for a major political party in a general election that we thought should have made a difference. But just as Democratic women didn't switch votes uh, switch parties to vote for Sarah Palin uh, in 2008 as vice president, people should not have expected that Republican women would switch parties to vote for Hillary Clinton. But I'm still unsatisfied with this ex explanation because the majority of white women did vote for Bill Clinton in 1996, his second term. In that election, 52% of white women voted for President Clinton. Why couldn't that happen again? Well, one reason uh, the political scientists say, is that politics is even more partisan now. Um, and another reason, I think, is that in 1996, we were approaching the height of President Clinton's very long economic boom. And today, many Americans are still really recovering uh, from the Great Recession. So the second point is economics. This is good because I'm an economist. Uh, or perhaps better um, put, the economics of resentment toward other race groups. Uh, there's no question that white men have lost relative position in the labor market. White men's medium wages are still far above any other group, except for Asian men. But in the mid-1950s, white men's median income was double that of black men. And now it's fallen to only a third more than black men, relatively fallen. White men used to make almost four times what black women made. Now they make only two times as much in terms of their median income. Working white women also had considerably higher median income than working black women in the 1950s, about two-thirds more. Now they are much nearer equality. Of course, the main reason for this is the growing education and accomplishments of, of black people. That is the main reason they've been able uh, to get ahead in the labor market. Um, but that falling relative incomes of whites is likely another major reason we are where we are today. Not only did they fall relatively, but real wages haven't grown. And as you know, when the pie is not growing, it's harder to share. And also, white uh, women's, and even though uh, white women's wages have grown, some as have black women's, uh, it's also quite likely that white married women were at least as concerned with their husband's incomes as with their own. And they apparently saw Trump as a better economic warrior for their families, and he promised to bring back the economy of the 1950s. That was apparently not as appealing uh, an approach to, to blacks and Hispanics. Not as much interest in going back to the 1950s on their part. An additional point related to economics, although Trump voters were more likely to lack four-year college degrees than Clinton voters, they weren't actually poor. Uh, Trump voters had above average income. Clinton won voters with incomes below 50,000 per year, according to CNN exit polls. And those who cared most about jobs voted for Clinton, not Trump. Uh, income doesn't predict uh, voting for uh, Trump as well as it did for other uh, Republicans. But it is the first election where education has made such a big difference. And as you probably also know, Clinton won the vote of white college-educated women, something Obama did not do. So that was a major accomplishment. So I have a couple more points, so I may have to go over. I apologize, but fortunately, Beverly went under. Um, <laughs> racism and sexism is the third major point. Researchers have found that Trump voters scored much higher on an index of racial resentment than Romney voters did four years ago. Voters are not necessarily more racist. They're just increasingly splitting along party lines. So um, the parties are becoming more identified uh, with one race or the other. Um, there's now a stronger partisan divide, the political economists say, and uh, between racially sympathetic and racially resentful whites. And uh, he believes, uh, political scientist Michael Tesler believes, that evidence suggests that racial resentment is a driving economic anxiety, not the other way around. 
Certainly Trump used racism, nativism, and sexism more than any other candidate uh, in memory. Uh, he had a very incendiary uh, language. And this tends to make racial and ethnic conflict perhaps more important now than economics and ideology. And this is something we share with other countries in the world. The Brexit vote could be looked like, uh, can be viewed that way. The rise of right-wing parties in Germany and France. Unfortunately, as researchers, we lack an index of resentment against women. Uh, but people who studied the 2008 primary said that women's solidarity didn't uh, help Hillary get votes. Hmm. The most with the most feminist feeling women apparently didn't bring a lot of votes to uh, Hillary. Yet Trump performed masculinity very well and we see the presidency as a masculine space. Um, even for the women who were abhorred by his masculinity, apparently the uh, positives outweighed the negatives. So you can imagine what some of the positives were just very quickly for women. His anti-abortion stance, his anti-immigration stance, that to them meant security. Um, the selection of P uh, Pence as vice president uh, reassured the evangelical vote. Evangelicals voted four to one for Trump. Um, he actually supported Social Security. That's very important to conservative women. And they also support tax cuts, which Trump also said he would do. So basically, sexism was not a deal breaker for many white women and may have helped attract white male voters. Uh, those who were turned off by Trump do not appear to have been drawn to vote for Clinton, and they simply may not have voted. So um, I'm going to conclude and just say that, um, as we know, women of color now make up nearly a third of female voters, and they support Democratic candidates by wide margins. It's these women who are driving political change. They are joined, however, by many white women. 53 million white women voted for Hillary Clinton. Together with like-minded men of all races, a progressive majority is growing stronger in the United States. The trick is turning that majority into electoral successes. Perhaps the best outcome from this election is the large number of women of all races who are now planning and running for electoral office. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Laylee Mapayan, Executive Director of the Wellesley Centers for Women at Wellesley College. And as with my colleagues, I want to welcome you for being here this morning and thank you for being part of this conversation that we're really trying to get started uh, today. And some of you may not know that we held a very similar forum eight years ago in response to the election of Barack Obama. Uh, at that time, we collaborated with IWPR to again bring policy issues and research together and to really try to influence the way that, inf uh, that research permeates uh, the topics that are of concern to us um, regarding women, uh, children, families, social policy, and, and so on. And as we were planning for this event over the course of a year, as you can imagine, we had to make many shifts in terms of how we understood the project that we were putting forth today. And I really want to appreciate my um, colleagues, my fellow directors of research institutes, for really honing in on some of the very proximal factors that landed us to this moment. But as a person who has worked in um, several fields of critical social theory, I want to talk about the larger view about how we got here. How shifts in, uh, that were generated by social movements and by other trends in society actually helped produce this. And I want to begin with a quote. I actually read it in the New York Times over the weekend. It's attributed to Malcolm X. It says, if you want to understand the flower, study the seed. Mm -hmm. So what is the seed of this moment, or what is the DNA of this moment? Um, I really want to think about it in terms of the history of the social movements within the uh, mid-20th century and beyond, which led to seismic shifts in the identity politics landscape of the U.S., which I think have had a great uh, deal of influence on this moment. For example, if we go back to the 1950s, which is actually the decade before I was born, so I have no personal memory of it, a lot of people still reference it as a kind of golden era in uh, United States history and in United States national identity. Um, of course, we know if we scratch beneath the surface of that uh, nostalgia, we find a lot of problems that uh, have manifested today. But for many people, they associate that era with um, an expanding middle class, a post-war economic boom, and Quietly, women and minorities in their places. A lot of people still psychologically idealize that older notion of what American identity is all about. Um, in the 1960s, many of the social movements that we're all familiar with today um, either sprung up or took new forms. Of course, the black social movement was in full force and had been crescendoing for many uh, decades. The second wave women's movement really um, 
uh, blossomed in other movements from farm workers to brown power to peace movements, uh, gay liberation, disability rights, etc., all burst forth making identity front and center in some respects more than ideology and politics or making identity equal ideology. Um, but we also had civil rights legislation during this uh, decade beginning to reshape um, the Democratic Party and uh, move it away from the sort of Dixiecrat history that uh, had really shaped it prior to that. In the 1970s, affirmative action, which attempted to institutionalize equity, fueled a backlash. And that very powerful backlash um, ended up um, causing some, some changes in society that really made us split in terms of the kinds of equities that we had on paper versus the lived experiences of people in many different identity categories. So, um, you know, whites during this period, at least some segment of white people began to feel like a minority because of the right, rise of so many different groups with different agendas for inclusion and the racial remaking of American life. Yet at the same time, members of U.S. minority groups began to enter and transform the mainstream in ways from which there would be no turning back. Um, in the 1980s, um, the modern conservative movement in some respects consolidated to oppose the gains of women and minorities in a way that was very palpable, signaled by the Ronald Reagan land side. And this steadily gained momentum fueled also by changes in the media. I think it's very important to point out how media as a vehicle for sharing points of view with the larger population has changed over time. You know, in 1972, when I was a kid, we were all watching the same three channels. By 1982, cable had opened us up to hundreds of channels. People could really find their niche with their political people, with their ideologies, with their identities, and, and never even cross-talk in a certain kind of way. So um, we also observed a, a different kind of oppositional politics, both in Congress but also in society. I like to point up um, some innovative social movements like ACT UP and even Hip Hop that really changed how different communities interacted politically. In the 1990s, we saw some shift to the right in the Democrats with the New Democrats and the Democratic Leadership Council, which left the left to organize differently. Um, in a way, it, it's, it related to the revival of some third party politics, which have complicated our political landscape now. And I would also argue that intersectional politics and intersectional political entity, uh, identities began to achieve a kind of momentum that again was really changing how we understood the American dream and how we could reach it for more people. Um, in the 2000s, 9-11 changed everything, creating new fissures in American culture and national identity and raising religion, um, specifically Islam, as a new identity of interest. Um, and the sort of narrative of Muslims versus the West overtook the Cold War, Cold War narrative as uh, the thing that polarized us globally. And so it was as though we couldn't live without the polarity and we had to substitute one polarity for another, which from, from my perspective is a big part of the problem that we face today. But at the same time, at the end of that, um, of that decade, we also got our first black president, which at least gave us a short-lived sense that we've sort of made it in terms of some of the equity struggles of the 1960s. Of course, this achievement, again, generated tremendous, tremendous backlash. It led to further consolidations of conservatism, a renewal of far-right extremism, and the revival of white identity movements. And so now we have a system in which we have a certain segment of our community still hearkening back to some idea that America was greater in the past. At the same time, we have so many of us who know that that past was in no wise ideal and are very focused on the future. So I won't go into, because of um, lack of time, some of the other international trends that were going on that were shaping how we experience things right here in the United States. But I want to just say that the end result of these many decades was extreme anxiety in the West, especially in the United States, especially among people who have traditionally been in power and who were socialized to expect that they would continue to be in power, individually or nationally. Um, so, you know, despite the substantial progress that we've made for people of color, color and other groups that have historically been marginalized, we're still collectively duking out who belongs in this society. We're still not all in agreement that we all belong here, which in my opinion really underlies much of the debilitating conflict that we lament today. So I'll more or less leave it at that, but there's one thing that I really, really want to point out before I sit down is that I want us to remember that we're in Barbara Jordan's room. I think that that's an important memory. Barbara Jordan 
um, was really um, an amazing uh, lawyer, educator, American politician, civil rights leader, and even a member of the Kaiser Family Foundation, which is why this room happened to be named after her. She was the first African American to be elected to the Texas Senate post-Reconstruction, and she was the first Southern black woman to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, where she famously sat on the House Judiciary Committee and opened the impeachment proceedings against Richard Nixon with a speech that has been rated as one of the most important of the 20th century. And just before coming over this morning, I was uh, talking with my sister, and we both were reminiscing about how we used to admire Barbara Jordan as kids. We remember her. She had that big of an impact on us because of her amazing oratory. And in fact, um, as has been said of her, her message united people of vastly different walks of life, bringing them together to stand as one and not in unison and say, yes, each one of us can make a difference and together we can make this nation stronger. So I'll end there. Thank you. going to have questions or just break for five minutes? Uh, questions, okay. Any questions of the pounds? Comments. Or comments. Oh, microphone's coming. I was just saying, you, you mentioned the word polarization. Something I've been thinking about and hoping that isn't true is, have you done any um, or had any thought process about whether or not it's part of the human condition that people say there's got to be somebody on the top and there's got to be somebody on the bottom? So as we look forward to what solutions are, are we always going to still be troubled with that concept that in order for me to feel better about myself, I have to feel like I am better and somebody else is lesser? Okay, I think there are, there are a lot of social scientists who have identified the effect of cognitive biases on our thinking, and even though that may be a type of cognitive bias that we have, we also know that equally true is the fact that in-groups and out-groups are always shifting. And the fact that we have the capacity to create, create, create uh, increasingly inclusive um, in-groups means that we can override that tendency to some extent. And I think that it's really about us rethinking what human nature means, because as we understand our human nature, so we expect from our politics. And if we expect that we have the capacity to override these oppositionalities and find common cause, then we will do that. I would just like to comment that um, we know from that index of uh, racial resentment that it's much, much lower among college-educated people. And so education is obviously a cure. I mean, obviously there's fear of the stranger and when you go to higher education, you're very often thrown together with people from 100 countries, all walks of life. It's kind of like what the army did for, for people during World War II in Vietnam. And it helps to have the contact and to have the communication. So it's definitely something we can overcome. In my I, would, view. I would just say quickly, cross-culturally, all cultures do not demonize difference. And, and, and so I would not say that it's human nature in the ways that some cultures demonize difference. A couple of hands in the back there. Econ no, racial racism drives economic anxiety instead of the opposite. Would you elaborate just a little bit on that? Uh, thank you. That is the view of Michael Tesler, the political scientist who, you know, has studied the election results quite a bit and studied these indices of racial resentment. One of the reasons why many women scholars are not so much familiar with that research mm -hmm. is that we don't have a matching research for women. There is very little research among political scientists about resentment toward women, like, for example, resentment toward women in leadership. But his point is just that when you look at who voted for Trump, they weren't low income. They had anxiety, but their anxiety was because there were the presence of others. But then the data show that the, the counties that voted for Trump don't have the most immigrants. The people who have the most immigrants and others voted for Hillary. So it isn't a real fear. It's kind of an irrational fear, which of course was, um, you know, exaggerated by the candidate. 
Uh, it's like it was the catnip for the vote. You know, the, the Republican vote was out there, and this was a brand new catnip that got a ton of people to the polls that probably hadn't come before. Okay. We have time Thank for you. one more question. The lady in front there had her hand up. Did you want to speak? You. Yeah, didn't did you have your hand up? Okay, there you go. Uh, good morning. I had a question really around identity politics, particularly with women. Um, that meant what uh, often what um, what you quoted, you were talking about kind of the behavior of white women. There was this symbiotic, this relationship with white men and what had happened to white men. Um, and I'm just wondering, I kind of uh, two questions in terms of the work um, is have there been studies, are you familiar with studies around kind of identity politics in terms of white women supporting white women? Because there was a female candidate. <laughs> um, so that's one. Secondly, um, in the uh, white, the, the stats for white women aren't not, are, aren't necessarily the same as white men in terms of progress. So it's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm just, in, if you could speak to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, no, I, I was, we probably all have commentary on that, actually. Yeah. I think that one of the things that's important to, to understand in terms of identity is that identities um, have multiple yeah. dimensions and facets. So different act identities get activated in different situations. Sometimes I'm going to come into the room as a woman. Sometimes I'm going to come into the room as a black person. Sometimes I come into the room as whatever else you know I am. And so I think that that... Um, you know, political situations can activate class identities. They can identify, uh, activate gender identities. They can activate, uh, you know, political party identities and so on. There is a, it, it isn't a straight line between an identity that we might identify about a person and which one of their identities is going to get activated in any given situation. And we do know that married women vote somewhat differently from single women among whites. Um, I want to do more research on that, but states that were 5% the states that voted for Trump had 5% uh, more married women in them than uh, five percentage points more married women in them than states that voted for Hillary. So uh, there's something, you know, going on there with marriage. Naturally, it, it, what your husband's income is affects your class status, and it may affect your politics of resentment as well. Your income might be going up, but you still make a lot less than your husband, and his income is going down. So you might be looking at it and thinking, well, I'm going to be better off if his goes up. And, you know, that's what Trump promised them. I, I was going to say that the, I, I think the 95, 94 percent of African American women who voted uh, uh, for Hillary were not voting on the basis of gender, but that that was an anti-Trump uh, vote. And, 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 and probably a, a vote that had more to do with their racial identity and their class identity than their gender identity. And I would just throw in, too, that we also uh, don't think often enough about religious identities as the role that they play as well. Okay, we run out of time. Can we give our panel a nice round of applause? And thank you. Next panel will be up. We're going to have a five-minute break.